All right, it's another Thursday night, and this is S.K. Barrett, and you are listening to Real Monsters. Joining me is the ever-lovely and talented Wes Hobrick. Hello, hello, hello from, I guess it's springtime now. Um, hopefully uh, that'll get have, better. Have you, have, you, have, you, have you even been outside today? Mm, yeah, a couple times, but not really doing much. But man... Yeah. Yeah, yep. it's it's bad here in uh, the West Coast uh, edition of Corona Central. Uh, Ugh. Yeah, but people are people are doing pretty good about staying away from each other. That's good, and that's kind of how it is down here too. I mean, obviously uh, Chicago and Cook County has the majority of our cases, but even here in my county where we only have two. You know, people are um, doing that stuff voluntarily. You know, they're taking the common sense measures voluntarily and doing that. You know, the distancing yeah. and whatever else. So, and hopefully it'll be over soon. Yeah, hopefully. I don't think it will. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, still on, hope- it's still on the upswing. And that's the yeah. crazy part. It's been... You know, things have been pretty serious for almost a month already, and it's still, the the trend line is still skyrocketing. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. I hope that once they do get it sorted for this year, that they can have something that'll give us a jump on next year, too. Right. If they're saying it's going to be seasonal. So, so oh, that fine. would suck having to do this again. I don't, uh, uh, yeah, it would suck so crazy bad. And yep. I don't know, I don't know if any, but any economy in the world could live through another quarantine. No, I don't think it could. But man. Yeah. And, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to ask, uh, do we have any crime history? Oh, we got a little bit of news. I was just going to oh, say work. that. That kind of gets weirder, too, with this whole quarantine thing. Um, Where are the serial killers going to find victims? (laughs) (laughs) This is true. Uh, Let's see. There was a failed uh, suicide by cop in in the Bronx, where I guess the guy just got his test results. And he um, went out and tried to start something with the officers, but they took him out before having to use lethal force. So, that's good. Yeah. A uh, separate New York man was arrested for coughing on FBI agents when they were um, trying to arrest him for a charge of putting 700% markup on the medical supplies he was selling. Uh, Yeah. Here's the thing. When there's no crisis, you can charge... Try in charge whatever the fuck you want for your products. Oh yeah, in in, the, in an emergency that is against the law. Yes, yes, and absolutely doing that is. But um, yeah. Oh, another one that was kind of disturbing. The uh, Rhode Island police, I guess the state police and the locals in that state, had been going door to door to um, make sure that there's no New Yorkers who are there in that people's seems houses. just a smidge unconstitutional. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it absolutely is. That's also like the uh, DOJ trying to get um, habeas corpus put on hold through congressional back channels. Why? They... <laughs> Well, they give the logic of it being, oh, it's an emergency and we need these powers, blah, 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 blah. But they don't. And for people who are listening who don't know what exactly habeas corpus regulates, what it does is it guarantees you things like the right to a speedy trial and a public trial. So basically, they could hold you indefinitely if you didn't have habeas corpus. See, these are the types of situations that cause your bureaucratic overlords to reveal their true nature. 
Yes. Um, you know, they can they can sweep anything underneath the or underneath the uh, umbrella of emergency uh, necessity, urgency, that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, they can twist anything to fit into that and they will because that's what they want to do. Absolutely. Reminds me of what uh, Rahm Emanuel said when Obama was still president. Yes. Never let a good crisis go to waste. Absolutely true. Both sides. Speaking of that. which, speaking of which, the police chief in Seattle, mm-hmm. in the while giving her Corona update press conference, asked the citizens to call nine one one. If oh, they heard God. hate speech. Oh, my God. Wow. Which is, guess what? Not illegal. Yeah. Well, and it's stupid to boot because it unnecessarily stretches resources. People are you know? already choking the 911 lines, calling in saying they saw people grouped together. Exactly. So you want to throw in hate speech into that pile? No. Wow. Well, Man, that's just stupid. And, and I illegal. mean, I, yeah, I mean, and I know that there's been some hate crimes that happened against Asian people specifically, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's all tied to speech either. No, like you know, these were just straight up assaults, is right. what I've seen. Yeah, which should of course it, be a crime, but it is. Yeah, it's already a crime. Yeah, we don't need to add speech to that. Um, but man, yeah, it's just so weird with all this. And then, oh yeah, you had a guy down in my neck of the woods in Belton, Missouri, who tried to blow up a hospital treating corona patients. Yeah. Um, and then just, uh, just yesterday, in fact, there was a... Uh, engineer of a freight train over oh, by yeah. Los Angeles and he purposely derailed his train to try and damage the um ship the, the Mercy hospital HS. Ship. Yeah. The hospital ship Mercy. Yeah. L- luckily uh nobody was killed with that. But on the same note they had to bring out hazmat to clean up, you know, fuel and all that. It looks like this guy will be facing uh, 20 years in prison for that. Yeah, he wasn't even close to going through, you know, succeeding on this. Because you know what? There's a reason why trains have steel tracks (laughs) that weigh about 500 pounds per rail. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Uh, I was going to say you didn't exceed it because it's a stupid plan to begin with. Yeah. Man. Um Yeah, I don't know what would cause somebody to do that, but apparently he thought that there was something going on in that hospital ship. Oh, well, see, this is just the people who are into conspiracies, they are like pigs and shit right now. Yes. This is just feeding those, those theories and setting up new ones. And oh, my God. Man. All right. Oh, yeah, and then you had the uh, other one. $35,000 worth of food had to be thrown out of a uh, supermarket because a woman coughed on it. Deliberately, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, she purposely coughed on it. It's just, And she's being charged. As she should be. Yeah. I think, but... Yeah, and, you know, and... It, speaks to and we know that our audience has a lot of common sense but you know just wash your food when you get it home too can't hurt to take a little bit extra precaution there yeah be Uh, careful about your cleaning chemicals that you're mixing up trying to boost them some of those things are (laughs) dangerous when they get put together they sure are hell some of them are dangerous when they're all by themselves like ammonia Yep. And Bleach. Um, have you watched any of Tiger King yet? <laughs> oh, my God. 
<laughs> yes. Uh, uh, that's. <laughs> He had a couple news items related to that. I, I, um, I rate that as one of, having one of the highest what the fucks per hour of any show. Oh, yeah. Man, that is so freaking weird. Joe Exotic. Oh, I read an uh, interesting article today about that. Did you know that he didn't even write most of his music? No. He's literally Millie vanilli in it <laughs> on there. I'll pass along the article when I can fish it out, but yeah, he didn't do that, but oh yeah, O.J. Simpson came out and said that he thinks that Carol fed her hubby to the tiger. So. Uh, and the memes, the the Tiger King memes are just a scream. Oh man. And there's so many of them. They are hilarious. But, I understand the police are going to take a closer look at uh, that missing husband case. They are. They actually reopened it because of the uh, documentary. So hopefully they can get something good out of that. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. And then I had a uh, last one here to end on. Since we're not hearing a whole hell of a lot of good news lately. There was one that I read that was out of Minnesota that was really interesting because it's such a quintessentially Minnesota story, too. A uh, doctor is on her way to make her rounds at the hospital up there, right? Yeah. And a police officer pulls her over because she's speeding, right? Okay. And she, he's getting everything written out and all that, and they're talking. And once he figures out she's a doctor... He doesn't even give her a warning. He gave her five P95 masks. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, that was pretty cool. So, if you need a mask, go out on the freeway and speed. In Minnesota. In Minnesota. <laughs> and be a doctor first. Yep. Uh, oh, um, yeah. And, uh, speaking of, uh, so I want to throw one thing out there. Sure. Uh, you said that there's no good news. Well, guess who has started up an entire good news channel? John Krasinski. John Krasinski. <laughs> That's and awesome. I, I, and I, I saw the first episode, and it's hilarious. And 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 it's not just funny, but some of, some parts of it are pretty funny. Uh, you know his uh, his uh, you know network name. Banner behind him was painted by his daughter. <laughs> That's awesome. It's it's pretty cool, and he's got some really, you know, honest to god good stories on there. It's pretty great. I really respect him as an actor and as a creative too. Yeah, but yeah, he seems like a genuinely good guy. I uh, can't wait to see a Quiet Place too when it comes out. He also does surprisingly well in Jack Ryan. I need to watch that. I haven't seen any episodes of that yet, but it wouldn't surprise me because he was in, um, what was that Michael Bay movie? Was it just called Benghazi? 13 Hours. 13 Hours yeah. was the name of it. Yeah, Yeah, because he was in that too. If you but... think he's just Jim, you're wrong. <laughs> hey, let's not do a, a film and TV show today. Let's do a yep. crime show. Moving. Oh, on we need to, we need to do the warning. Oh yeah, that might be a good idea. So, here's the warning. If you're squishy and squeezy and things bug you and you're Get the vapors when you see uh, bad images or hear bad descriptions of bad people doing bad shit. This ain't the show for you. Exactly. There won't be a whole lot of the uh, deviant sexual stuff in this one, but there's probably going to be quite a bit of blood. Uh, and body parts. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true, too. But, you know, arguably the uh, Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run also known as the Cleveland Torso Murderer, is one of the uh, most interesting unsolved murder series in the United States, I think. Do we have a lot of unsolved serial killers? 
Well, when you get further back in time like this, oh, well, I yeah, think that's we true. Do. This was this was in the 30s, so it, it was a lot tougher. Yeah, yeah, this would have been and what to put somebody as his contemporary, Albert Fish, I think was executed in 38, wasn't he? Might look that up while we're talking. Yeah, and this one they've estimated, you know, for confirmed cases from 1935 to 1938. Mm Mm-hmm. And his totals for that was uh, 13, but possibly up to 20. Right. That's what they think. And it was almost an equal spread of men and women, too. Well, let's find out more about this guy. (laughs) And we are... Assuming it's a male, and I think there's reasonable uh, evidence to that. Um, yep. Besides which, most serial killers are. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, to sort of set up the scene for this, it's Cleveland, Ohio. It's the uh, mid to late 1930s, as we said. And during that time... Cleveland was a city on the rise. There was a lot of immigrants who were coming in to fill the plentiful uh, factory jobs in steel and manufacturing. And as a whole, the uh, Great Depression wasn't felt quite as hard there because of that. But it was still, you know, technically going on. Well, like any depression, some areas get hit harder than others. Yeah. Exactly. And in Cleveland, in a lot of places, they were recovering from it as best they could, too. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, they were growing rather fast. They had some pretty big things in the works, too, like the uh, Great Lakes Exposition, which was slated for 1936, and then the uh, Republican National Convention for that same year. Um. I would assume the Great Lakes Exposition might have been something like a mini World's Fair, if I had to guess. Right, yeah. Um, Yeah, we've had some expos in this area over the years. It's been a long time, but we've had those. And they, yes, they're very much a small World's Fair. Hmm. Interesting. But... Yeah, so the uh, series starts in 1934. I was just looking for that. And uh, they all happened around in this area of Cleveland, which we can see where they are by the spots there. That's where the bodies were found. It's, right. It started and it happened in this area called Kingsbury Run, which was a uh, dried creek bed for many years. And then essentially what it became with the uh, Great Depression was almost like a uh, Hooverville, which is like a transient camp for people who would right, come there. Yeah. and Yeah, uh, yeah, they were uh, homeless encampments. That's literally what they were, and they were called Hoovervilles because of uh, they, the president. Blamed, they, blamed, they blamed the <laughs> Depression on President Hoover. Yep. And uh, Kingsbury Run also sat next to a uh, other area called the Roaring Third, the Roaring Third, which was just east of it. And that one, that area was known more as your red light district. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's brothels, bars, gambling houses, uh, that sort of thing. Okay. And... You know, the people, they mixed in a lot between both areas. So you had, you know, people from the uh, hobo jungle is actually what Elliot Ness called it, what he called Kingsbury Run. Oh. They would often go over to, you know, the Roaring Third and back and forth and probably drink what little money they had away at the speakeasies. Sure. But... Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Not all the speakeasies were the slick, uh, you know, basement, uh, you know, knock on the <laughs> door and give the password kind of establishments. Every neighborhood had a speakeasy of some, you know, level of repute mm-hmm. or another. They weren't all classy joints. 
That's exactly correct. Um, and I don't know if our listeners know this or not, but technically, in order to be a speakeasy, it has to have a false front. Like oh, a, uh, I didn't business. know that. Yeah. So, so, so a, 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 a literally a front business. Yes. Yep, to hide it. But, yeah, you had those, and getting closer to Chicago and here in Illinois, they would also call them uh, Blind Pigs was the other big name for it. And I can't, for the life of me, remember <laughs> why. Well, it might have been that. from the, sometimes you could go blind from the shitty bathtub gin. Yeah, this is true. I don't know. I'm going to have to look that up when we're done with the show. Because uh, um, some unscrupulous and or incompetent distillers, home distillers, would use uh, methanol. Yep. Which, they would. Which and is literally poison. poison. <laughs> yep. But, yeah, so... We also get to the uh, other important player in this whole um, legend as it's unfolding, and that was a guy by the name of Elliot Ness. Yeah. And this Um, guy, this guy's got a little bit of a name. He does. Uh, People might recognize the name from The Untouchables. Yes. Either the movie or the TV series. But the uh, true way that Ness received his reputation as a, quote, untouchable cop was because he was working with a uh, corrupt police force in Chicago when he was going after Capone. Right. As a, he was a T-man then, a treasury man. Um, not necessarily a G-man yet, but um, in the post-Prohibition era, so after 1933... Ness assembled a team of the most honest and moral cops in the city called, quote, the Secret Six. They uh, worked to stop the bootlegging of alcohol by gangsters who were selling alcohol illegally to avoid the tax man. And every day, apparently, Ness turned down a $2,000 bribe, which would equal about $37,478 in today's money. And his entire annual salary then was 2800. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so like Jesus, 11 times his sal- annual salary? Yep. That's substantial. Absolutely. And bootlegging, I learned recently, comes from Cornish smugglers who used like uh, used to uh, use hip waders, chest waders, to, oh. to uh, haul the um, contraband. So a big ship would come into the bay, and the little boats would row it back and forth to the shore, and and the guys would wear chest waders or hip waders uh, and stuff the legs of the waders with uh with the contraband interesting the bootlegs <laughs> well there you go and but yes yeah, so ness was the guy who brought down al capone in chicago right. and quite a few other gangsters there at the time but once that work started drying up he took the uh, job of public safety director the city of Cleveland. So I guess it would essentially be like a uh, police chief almost. Yeah. Or the or head a of commissioner it, but... or something like that. Mm hmm. Yeah. And so when he gets there um, in 1934, 1934 was the year that they found the uh, first body. And another thing that we should stress with this, and people will see it when we. Uh, Described the M.O., but only three of the of the 13 who were killed were positively identified. Wow. Yeah. So you're talking about a pretty big amount of 
John and Jane Doe's there. Um, but yeah, they were all happening in Kingsbury Run and the dried out riverbed there. It was a dark and dangerous place in the 30s and a hobo jungle, like we said. Um, and, you know, it had a lot of transients in the area, too, because of the winters around there. They would often ride the, the rails to somewhere warmer when that happens. Sure. You know, Midwestern winters suck. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Um, so in September of 1934, a young man is walking on the shores of Lake Erie. And he finds the lower half of a female torso amputated at the knees and just laying there on the shore. I don't know if we, I don't think we have any pictures of that one yet, but this one, it took them a while to really tie a uh, lot of these murders into the series too. Sure. So well, you have, it you wasn't know, even much of a concept in those. I mean, this is decades away from anything really close to the behavior analysis stuff. Uh, yeah. And even the term serial killer. They didn't even Still have the words 50 for years it. ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Dang. Uh, yeah, so that, you know, was one thing that was working against them there. Uh, the Cuyahoga County coroner, a guy by the name of A.J. Pierce, noted some sort of chemical preservative on the skin, which turned it, quote, red, tough, and leathery. Hmm. I'm not sure what the reason for that would be. Yeah, that's so that was never identified any further. I think they found the uh, same substance on one of the other bodies, but they still um, weren't exactly sure why he would have done that. You know, honestly, the uh, first thing I thought of when I was looking at it was the Silence of the Lambs with Buffalo Bill. Mm hmm. Like tanning? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> or like Ed Gein, who did that too. Right. But they had. This was done on the body, not not after being skinned. Right, right. Yeah, this but one maybe, was but done maybe, on the body. Who knows? Maybe the person didn't know what the hell they were doing. That very well could be. You know, I don't know with that, but... Yeah, they uh, searched nearby where this first corpse was found, and they found a, a few other non-consequential items for identification purposes. Okay. And a uh, few other body parts that really didn't help either. The head was never found. And the victim was never ID'd. So what they did was they took to calling her the Lady of the Lake. Female in her mid-30s. And um, it wouldn't be until actually 1936 that she would be considered uh, canonical in terms of the uh, Mad Butcher's victims. And it's for that reason as well that they actually called her victim number zero on top of it. Um, moving ahead about a year into September of 1935, you have two teenage boys who are again walking in the run, and they discover a... Uh, decapitated, emasculated corpse of a white male at a place called, and this humor is unintentional, Jackass Hill. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea why they call it Jackass Hill. Um, but on the map, it is where East 49th Street dead ends into Kingsbury Run. And the body this time only had a pair of socks on. It was completely drained of blood as well, just like the first one. Well, that's not hard to imagine if there's no head. I mean, yeah. Does the second one not have a head either? Yeah, no head on this one either. Okay. 
Yeah. That is your that is the Mad Butcher's signature. He always decapitates them. Gotcha. And um as a general rule, he would often do it when they were still alive too. Oh jeez. So here's yeah. this the guy with the socks. Yep. And yeah, he just dumped the body there. Yeah, and at once this you, point, once it... you take the head off, it's hard to keep the blood inside. <laughs> Well, it, what's interesting there, though, is that he didn't bleed them out at the scene where he dumped them. Right. He did that somewhere else, and then he dumped the body. Which uh, will come in handy as a point to remember when we get to another famous murder that this guy might be connected to. Okay. Oh, um, yeah. The uh, This body had rope burns on both wrists, too. So he must have had issues with uh, subduing the victim because the woman didn't have the rope burns. Right. right. Well, um, and see, these are these are all indications that the uh, the suspect was a male because you know it's almost it's really unlikely that a woman would be able to subdue a man and transport his body after death. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just the uh, physical issues that that right. raises, the logistical ones too. But yeah, yeah, another quite possibly a lot easier to tie a guy up today. <laughs> yeah, <it could laughs> but you be. still gotta, you still gotta move him. Yep. Um, it's interesting. The butcher actually left fingers this time. Oh. Which I'm not totally sure why. I think he's smart enough to where he was going to do a lot of this to uh, hamper identification of who he's killing. But then why leave the fingers? I just don't know. But um, because of that, this victim was identified as Edward Andresy, age 28. He was a... Uh, Rumored homosexual and frequenter of the Roaring Third. Um, and he had a bit of an arrest record for petty crimes, but nothing huge. Okay. Um, and nearby, actually, around the time they found his body, there was another decapitated and emasculated male found. This guy was in his 40s. So you're talking um, probably less than a quarter mile from where this body was. And this one was the other one that was covered in the same chemicals as the Lady of the Lake. Okay, so... It, it, we... Uh... What's the time span between, what's the cooling off period that we're talking about here so far? From the uh, Lady of the Lake to uh, Mr. Andresay, it's about a year. Pretty close to a year. Okay. Um, and then Mr. Andresay to the body that was found near him, I'm not sure. Because I don't think they ever established a uh, time of death. On that one. So that was a, uh, another one that was never ID'd on top of it. So. But uh, moving ahead a bit, moving ahead about three months, in 1936, a woman discovers half a female torso ne neatly wrapped in newspaper and packed in two bushel baskets. <laughs> so he's varying it up a little bit yeah uh, kind of reminiscent of those uh, you know luggage bodies on the English uh, railroads yeah it really is I hadn't thought about them we should do a, a uh, episode on them too yeah absolutely yes. but um yeah, alongside with this, he had the two baskets were left right alongside the Hart Manufacturing Building, 
in one of the most uh, busy parts of the city. So definitely not hiding. Yeah. He's getting brazen about it. Um, which which you would do, right? I mean, oh yeah. This is what uh, this is what the human brain does really well is, um, you know, the more you get away with something that's risky, the more you believe you will always get away with that. Very true. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, if you went to somebody you know, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, and said, hey, what do you think about getting into this metal box and driving, you know, across the land at 70 miles an hour? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, you might, you, you could die doing that. Do you want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, absolutely. The, but we do it every day without even thinking about it now because we get away with it. And that's what happens with with all the things that you get away with, you know. If you're, you know, if mm-hmm. you if you cheat on your spouse you, and get away with it, you're going to do more of it. Oh yeah, and you well, take and bigger is... risks. Oh, absolutely, and we've seen this already a hundred times with serial killers too. Yep. But yeah, this one, her head was never found again. Um. But other body parts were found in a vacant lot nearby. Um, this was about 10 days after her murder. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, the cause of death again was decapitation. And this time, though, they thought it was kind of weird as well. He let rigor mortis set in before uh, eviscerating and um, breaking apart the uh, other parts really? of the body. That's just making your job harder. Yeah. But Yeah, and I think it, he's smart enough where he'd know that, too. Well, you think so, but, you know, not knowing anything about the person, you know, it's entirely possible that, they, you know, the, he got interrupted and had to leave the body for a period of time. What is it? True. What is it? Rigor sets in at what? Twelve hours? I think so. I might have Something to check around. that. Obviously, sure. it depends on environmental conditions um, mm-hmm. and a few other factors, but I think it's roughly twelve hours. Well, and with the environment there, you're talking about January in Cleveland, right? So, yeah, I mean it's going to be colder than hell out there. Um, oh, it's a few hours after death, usually lasting from one to four days. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, let's see. This one, she was actually ID'd as Florence uh, Polillo, P-O-L-I-L-L-O. She was a uh, waitress, barmaid, prostitute over in the third. Um, and then, you know, it's about this time that the police are starting to get a little bit desperate. They want to catch somebody, and Elliot Ness is on the case. Yeah. But move it to uh, June 1936. Two young boys discovered the head of a white male wrapped in a pair of trousers and sitting next to the 55th Street Bridge. Um, and this one, that bridge is right in front of the Nickel Plate Railroad Police Building. What? Yeah. The butcher was essentially saying, this is Elliot Ness's office. The oh, butcher is essentially saying, fuck you. Oh, man, that's, that's, that's ballsy. Yeah. Um, this guy was a 20-something. And this corpse was, again, clean, completely drained of blood. Um, And it's still no ID on this one. It's interesting because they had tattoos that could have done it. Yeah. And they still had a couple fingerprints, but no ID. 
Well, here's the thing is, you know, um, you know, there's a good chance that a lot of these unidentified people were homeless. Mm-hmm. There were, oh, there, so people come and go and nobody knows who their neighbors are, or who anybody is. And somebody disappears. You don't know why. Because mm-hmm. they might have just got there yesterday and now they're gone and who knows. Exactly, and it's not like you have a uh, computer system that right. can help you keep track of that info either. Well, there's no system of any kind. There's no paper and pen system. There's nobody. Nobody's watching over this stuff. The people are just these are these spring up spontaneously. Hmm. Well, I think that uh, the smarter detectives had a bit of a filing system where they could, though. But maybe not. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so like I said, they start sort of sparring Elliot Ness and the Mad Butcher in the press about all this. And Ness, he's working his ass off and he's working his people to the bone. They had uh, two detectives that were brought in to take point on that. Okay. These guys interviewed a total of 1,500 people over about two months. Jesus. Yeah. And then um, Ness with the rest of the squad, they did about 5,000 people in that same time period. So, yeah, like I said, just running them ragged. Yeah, that's... um... That's a lot of interviews. Yeah. I mean, that load. just takes just the amount of time involved in that is astonishing. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But um, this was also when uh, you would see some of Ness's other kind of questionable tactics coming out. Um, one thing with that that he would like to do, yeah, when he was going around to the uh, different houses around the area and the shanties in Kingsbury Run, he would take a fire inspector with him. And the reason for that is he doesn't need a warrant. Oh, so doing, just doing a fire inspection. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, do you mind answering some questions while we're here? Yeah, that was essentially it. Um, but yeah, and they went through, did all that, and they started questioning more and more people with that. And this actually comes to, in my opinion, one of our better suspects, a uh, doctor by the name of Francis Edward Sweeney which I don't think I have a picture of him, but Ness, he was really sold on this guy being the killer. Yeah. But he couldn't do anything about it because he didn't have the physical evidence he needed. And then on the flip side of that, Sweeney's cousin was a congressman in Ohio. Uh. Yeah. So Ness is worried if I rock the boat, what's going to happen? And then the uh, other thing he was worried about was a libel suit, if it turned out to be wrong, which could, you know, in essence, ruin him in his career. Well, you you can't sue for libel over criminal proceedings. I mean, unless unless he's, you know, going talking to the to the press before trial and shit like that. That I'm not sure of, um, whether they did that or not. But, you know, and maybe Ness was just worried about the uh, lawsuit itself, you know, bankrupt me right. on a, uh, you know, frivolous one. But, yeah, this Francis Edward Sweeney was a doctor, 
And come 1956, he was actually institutionalized for uh, paranoid schizophrenia. Oh, really? And, yeah. Now, schizophrenics, yeah. on the whole, are not violent. It's not, you know, something it's not, that... It's, it's not... It's not a... It doesn't go hand in hand, no. Right. Right. But... Yeah, I mean, this guy, he was diagnosed that way. And it was about this time, too, that Ness and his detectives were sold that this has to be the work of a doctor. We're talking about um, decapitations and, you know, surgically cutting off limbs with great efficiency and great speed. That's not just your average Joe. He's yeah, going to be able to do that. It's average for a butcher. Yeah. <laughs> if he knows to be, enough. Well, yeah. You know, a veterinarian. A, you know, I think the the tendency to leap to, a, you know, medical training, a physician, I think is uh, very narrow thinking. Yeah, I think it was when you look at like the uh, Jack the Ripper case. When they tried to do that. Yeah. Well, but, I mean, it could be just a skilled hunter. Uh, could be a, you know, a lot of different possibilities. The fact of, you know, the first kill only had, what was the hands and head, right? Removed. Um, no, the first one I thought was just a torso. Let's oh, okay. take another look. Okay. So, so it's not a progression. No. Okay. No, I mean, it's definitely his signature, which gets um, improved upon with every single kill. But that's, you know, like any other killer does that, too. Uh, True. But, yeah, they figured it had to be, you know, somebody with that kind of experience or training. Butcher, doctor, veterinarian, something like that, or a crazy ass doctor like yeah. Francis Sweeney. But yeah, um, this guy, the uh, butcher himself, whether it was Sweeney or not, bo uh, bothered the living hell out of Elliot Ness for basically the rest of his life by sending him postcards. Oh, I think we have one of those. Yep. But coming right up. Um Yeah, he was just he was different, man. So so hold on. So this this murderer Knew that Elliot Ness was after him. Obviously, it would have been in the papers. Yeah. Never was caught. And mm -hmm. and kept hounding Elliot Ness. Yeah. And it's a degree of sadism that you don't see very often. But he obviously stopped the killing, or did he? That's really a good question, because the, the way that it stopped was interesting, and it means um, skipping forward to 1938, okay. where they finally had a, a couple other killings on their hands through there. So what happens is Ness and his um, detectives in uniforms, he had about 600 cops, they uh, were planning a raid of... Kingsbury Run and everything that's in it. Wow. So they did that one night in um, 1938. And after they arrested about 63 people, they drove the rest of them out and they literally burnt it all to the ground under Ness's orders. <laughs> yeah. But, and the, yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you know, Ness, he thought that the press was going to praise him and, you know, kiss his ring 
mm-hmm. over all this, but he got drugged through unmercifully because they saw it for what it was, a desperate move on his part. Right. Um, but one weird thing about that, after they burnt the, uh, after they burnt Kingsbury Run to the ground, yeah. the killing stopped. At least they stopped in Cleveland, anyway. So um, he didn't catch him, but he definitely caused it to at least move. Something, yeah, something did. They they stopped happening in Cleveland, so it had the effect that he was looking for. Yeah, I also wonder, though, if maybe it wasn't a case of uh, correlation, not equaling causation. Mm. I mean, I just, I don't know with that, you know. True. But, and this is where we get into the Black Dahlia. Did I send the uh, you did. picture of Elizabeth Short? You, okay. You did. The That's newspaper, actually the, the uh, that is actually Kingsbury Run burning. And that one that's up right now. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's when we get to the Black Dahlia in L.A. in um, February of 1947, where you have a uh, actress, a raven-haired actress by the name of Elizabeth Short, whose body was found dumped uh, surgically bisected in half, drained of blood, and a uh, Glasgow smile carved into her face. But not beheaded. Uh, Close, but not yeah. fully. Yep, no beheading with that. But, yeah, so they um, found that, and the LAPD weren't totally sure what to do at first. So what they did was they actually went through all the files that Cleveland had on the Mad Butcher. Okay. Because they thought there might be, you know, some uh, commonalities there. But, you know, they really didn't find a whole lot with that. Personally, with uh, the Black Dahlia, I'm still of the opinion that it was probably George Hodel. Yeah. Who did that one? Look, man, if your kids think you did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then there's a good chance. <laughs> yeah. If you can't fool your own kids, then you ain't fooling anybody. Exactly. I mean, when he's a homicide detective to boot, man. Yeah. Hey. I, I think, I think on the one hand, uh, you know, there are some similarities and the fact the the Cleveland butcher he he modified his MO mm-hmm. you know he changed things up as he went along but he never did leave the heads on attached no. and no he didn't and Elizabeth's short um she still had her head on. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, I think it's a, it's a thin thread to, to tie those together. And I don't think it holds. I agree. I think it's a possibility that both the murderers were doctors. But other than that, I don't see a whole lot in the way of common sense commonality. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, they had a... Uh, Few more murders in '37. In June, they found a uh, 40-year-old African American woman who was beheaded. Her skull was found under the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge, and her uh, bones and body were stuffed inside a burlap bag. She had to be ID'd from her dental records. Her name was Rose Wallace. Of Scoville Avenue. Um, and skipping ahead just a month, July 1937, 
there's a, a couple of strikes going on in Cleveland that summer. Okay. So the National Guard is there to maintain order, right? Right. They, a uh, guardsman standing watch by the West 3rd Street Bridge, when he sees a piece of victim number nine in the wake of a passing tugboat, um, over the next few days, the rest of the body, besides the head, is recovered from the Cuyahoga River. And this victim was a male, mid-30s, eviscerated, and his heart ripped out. Wow. So that escalation, yeah, makes me wonder. I would bet you he ate it. Could be. Oh, and um, that picture up there with the hobo who looks like he's out of central casting. casting. Yeah. <laughs> That was one of the uh, lead detectives. Oh, going he, undercover? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's you know, the cartoon character hobo with the, with, the, with the bandana on the end of a stick is actually based on what people did, as that picture shows. Mm -hmm. It really did tie up all of their um, belongings in a bandana or a handkerchief and then tie it hmm. to the end of a stick as a means of carrying it. And that's oh. how little they had. They could put it in a bandana. Dang. It's the depression for you back then. Yeah. But, yeah, um, let's see. And over the next few days, yeah, the rest of the body was recovered. And it also uh, makes me wonder with that, with the rage getting built up, if it isn't somehow tied to uh, impotence, as we often see this well, level of savagery is. True. But we don't, there, there hasn't been any mention of sexual assault so far. No, none at all. But none. that's where with the uh, knife, you can actually view it as a uh, substitute yeah. for the sexual act. Yeah, I suppose so. At least that's what um, people like Ebbing would say. Ricard von Kraft Ebbing. Well, and then, but sometimes a knife is just a tool. Yeah. Oh, oh, of course. Yeah. I think there's enough um, symbolism in what was happening with these, though, that it might go a bit beyond just being a tool, you know? Right, and there are other reasons for a person to be enraged besides impotence. Sure. Absolutely. But it could be. Um, let's see, April of 1938. While on his way to work in the flats, another name for Kingsbury Run, a uh, young laborer saw what he at first thought was a dead fish on the riverbank. Turned out to be part of a woman's leg. This is victim number 10. Um, a month later, two burlap bags were fished out of the drink that contained much of her torso and the rest of her legs. And um, for the first time, drugs were actually found in the system, too. Um, and was that... Uh, yeah, there's no way to know if that was incidental or necessary. forced yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's why they were uh looking for the arms oh. to try to figure that out look for a needle mark sure um let's see august 16th 1938 three scrap collectors found the torso of a woman wrapped in a man's double blessed double breasted blue blazer and um, wrapped again in a quilt. This guy is just all over the map in his <laughs> disposal methods. He is. Sometimes wonder... he's, sometimes he's kind of hiding them. Uh, sometimes they're in the river. Sometimes they're on land. Sometimes they're in the, by the lake. Sometimes they're by the goddamn police station. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes you wonder whether he was doing that purposely. If he had a grand plan with it, if he was that smart, or whether he was just disorganized in his thought to that point. 
Well, he wasn't I, disorganized enough to get caught. This is true. I think he might have been doing that purposely. Yeah. I, yeah. It, August 16th, 38. That was, I believe, one of his last kills. Confirmed ones. Yes. Yeah, the, can- the canonical ones. Um, oh, and the uh, new medical examiner by this time, a guy by the name of Dr. Gerber, noted that some of the parts that were fished out of these more recent victims yeah. appear to have been refrigerated. Hmm. I could... That's That's interesting that he could could identify that i mean freezing maybe there was freezer burn i don't know freeze yeah uh you know freezing causes the um the fluids to crystallize Mm -hmm. in the cells so maybe there's a, a small amount of that in refrigeration i don't know i'm not sure i mean that also it could be indicative of cannibalism again True. If he was saving parts to eat. And it was the Depression. True. Survival cannibalism. Right. Right. But again, he's not, he's leaving the best cuts behind so often. This is true. Wonder why. But, um, oh yeah. Not too long after these latest bodies, police find two more, literally, again, only yards away. Hmm. And these other two, number 11 and number 12, were also very visible from Ness's office. Yeah, I mean, you tie that in with the the postcards, and this guy was clearly taunting. Yeah. I mean, in the NFL, that would get you a, a flag. (laughs) <laughs> oh absolutely. it's very obvious taunting um wow that's that's pretty bold yeah and i would and i think that goes against the idea of it being survival cannibalism because he's he's enjoying what he's doing oh absolutely there's a definite degree of sadism going on there yeah, he's not. This is not just you know. Oh gosh, I hate doing this, but I'm starving. This is a guy who <laughs> is uh, getting a lot of pleasure out of his work. Oh yeah. And then um, come July 1939, um, and keep in mind this is after the killings as we know it have stopped. Yeah. In 1938, in July of 39, the new county sheriff Martin O'Donnell arrests a fifty a fifty two year old Czech bricklayer by the name of Frank Doliesel for the uh, murder of Flo Polio. And uh, apparently Doliesel lived with her for a while. Um, he also knew, apparently, Edward Andrese and Rose Wallace. Oh really? But <laughs> this is the uh, curator of the police uh, museum in Cleveland, who I'm quoting right here. Yeah. He called Deliesel's confession a, quote, bewildering blend of incoherent ramblings and neat, precise details, almost as if he had been coached. Yeah. (laughs) But, yeah, and it gets even weirder, too. Because shortly before his trial, he's found dead in his cell. Uh, Deliesel is 5'8", but he hung himself from a 5'7 hook. And I Gerber's mean, autopsy... It, it's possible to do that. It's not easy. It no. takes, takes a lot of willpower. But now, um, Gerber's autopsy also showed six broken ribs that were all incurred when he was in the county lockup, when DeLiesel was there. So, hmm. kind of a Jeffrey Epstein moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and that's essentially where this petered out. She had uh, Ness, who left his job in Cleveland in 1942 after he uh, got caught, actually, trying to downplay a DUI that he received. Uh, oh, he himself? Yes. Oh. Um, he left his job after that, and he became basically a drunk, and he just sort of faded into oblivion. Died in 1957. So he, he pretty much didn't work anymore after that, huh? Yeah. Wow. Well, um, that's, that's really sad. I mean... It is. It really is. I mean, the guy had great instincts, and he was a hell of a detective. Yeah, yeah. But, he, he, you know, he wasn't 100% angel, was he? No. No, I mean, they never are, but... Yeah. Oh, and all official police records on this have been lost, destroyed, or removed. Whoa. That was, again, something that I read in the piece by the curator of the Cleveland Police Museum. So, that's definitely something I would trust. Wow. Yeah. Well, but, you know, um, it's not, sometimes it's incompetent. It's not always nefarious. Yep. It Don't may. ever ascribe to malice that which can be adequately explained by stupidity. Yep. <laughs> I love that. And Lon's razor. Yep. Oh, man. So, so have there been any other viable suspects, you know, put forward? Not that I know of. Because um, these unsolved cases usually have, you know, uh, a, a number of, you know, armchair sleuths who think they can figure it out. Yeah. I mean, there might be. But I'm honestly not sure if there are any that actually merit looking at much more. But, yeah, I think what's really sad about it is that most of those victims are still unidentified. Yeah. Well, that was, um, that was the intention, wasn't it? That was his intention, was to keep him, un I keep him from being identified. I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah. Oh, I agree. I totally agree. Um, yeah. Th oh, yeah. Ness's profile. Elliot Ness did derive a profile of the guy. He kept it kind of general, though. He said, strong guy with medical knowledge. That's, um, that's pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Um, Oh, yeah, and the other thing that Ness did when the investigation started getting more desperate, he put many hospitals, doctors, and medical workers on surveillance. Oh. Like, 24-hour surveillance. Um, but yeah, it was in 1938 as well, right after the murders stopped, that uh, Dr. Sweeney institutionalized himself. Hmm. Not sure if that means anything, but interesting to note. And so, did he did he remain institutionalized? Do we know? I think so. And then he died in '64. Well, somebody was mailing these postcards from <laughs> other places. Yeah. Very true. And Ness received them into the 50s. Hmm. Just very, very like bizarre that. case. Yep. I mean, there's so much to go on and yet so little. It's really a strange combination that way. It is. Very, very interesting. All right. And it's, 
Any last you know, thoughts? It was also, oh, I was just going to say it was one of the first cases in the media where you had this sort of um, apocryphal battle of villainous psychopath yeah. and um, and tough as nails G man um, with the butcher versus Elliot Ness, but. Yeah, the butcher ultimately broke him once you get down to it. Oh, that's it's really unfortunate. I mean, you know, it, 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 in a lot of ways, the uh, it does kind of remind me of the you know the film trope of the taunting serial killer who's leaving clues and wanting the you know the uh, the preferred investigator to tr- hunt them down for a final confrontation kind of shit. But it, mm-hmm. it kind of really happened. <laughs> oh, yeah. To a large extent. It definitely did here. Uh, the only thing missing would have been, you know, letters post printed in the newspapers. <laughs> but, True. I uh, wonder why you didn't do that. Hmm. Yeah. Who <laughs> knows? Who knows? Still a very interesting very case. Very interesting case. All right. Well, thanks so much for another uh, another great episode and for all your hard work. Good well, show. Thanks for having me. I enjoy it. All right. Good night. Good show. Good night. Wow, 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 wow,